Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, and I like to think that I can keep calm in a difficult situation based in my background in psychology and criminal justice. But when I had kids, I was constantly questioning if I was doing things right or how I was messing them up this time. Add in a child with a chronic illness and I found myself full of anxiety. Before my son's diagnosis, it felt like every minute was a ticking time bomb. Is now the time that we should go to the hospital? Are they going to tell me there's nothing wrong again? Or am I overthinking it? Sure, I was keeping it together mostly on the outside, but the overwhelm of staying strong for everyone else was constantly threatening to be too much and result in one of those locked in the bathroom for a quick ugly cry moments. You know what I mean. Momsiety is a real thing for every new parent, and when you add in a chronic illness, food allergy, or other challenging circumstances, it can become downright isolating. And that's why the Momsiety Club is here for you. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood, so join me and let's get rid of this Momsiety together. Welcome to episode 28 of the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm Tori Levine, and I am so glad you are here. Today, I'm sharing all about my postpartum anxiety after having a second child and giving a little wrap-up of the last two, three, including this one, episodes. A few updates and reminders before we get started. There is a free resource associated with the last three episodes, which you can find by going to the free resources section on join.momsietyclub.com. And momsiety is M-O-M-X-I-E-T-Y. If you are already on the Momsiety Club email list, you have access to this episode's freebie as well as past freebies via the free resources page that you get a link to every week in your email. If you are not yet on that list, simply sign up to receive free resources at join.momsietyclub.com. And the link is in the show notes, just like any other links or things that I reference that you would have to go searching for. Okay, one of the updates that email subscribers are receiving within the next week is some information on how they are able to join in and try out a Momsiety Club session. Momsiety Club sessions are combinations of support and exercise, so new and not-so-new moms can use um, these physical and emotional tips to deal with the demands of motherhood. So again, just head to join.momsietyclub.com if you uh, are not on the list already. And if you have not already, please hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. That way, the newest episodes get downloaded right to your phone so your busy mom brain doesn't have to remember one more thing. Over the last two weeks, I've shared my anxiety journey before and after having my first child and discussed my oldest diagnosis with very early onset inflammatory bowel disease and the additional anxiety that comes along with mothering a child with a chronic illness. Last week, I mentioned that the anxiety that was associated with each time he said his stomach hurt or wondering if it was like a normal bellyache or signs of inflammation or a flare, as well as the anxiety bracing for each infusion and each time a letter from the insurance company came made me feel like I would never be calm enough to have a second child. Um, Well, (laughs) after about a year on Ruben's infusions, things calmed down a bit and my anxiety calmed down a bit too. So we were able to start discussing and, you know, trying for another child to add to our family. Uh, I just want to say I went a little further into the detail about some of the things that I went through during my second pregnancy in episode five, Are You Mom Shaming Yourself?, as well as in some YouTube videos, which kind of documented some of my pregnancy and were um, some prenatal exercises. So if you are interested in any further details or any of those videos, the links to those are down in the show notes. But briefly, um, 
when I called my OB and told them that I had a positive pregnancy test. You know, they took my rundown of any medications I was taking to ensure they were safe. Well, I had gotten a call back and was told to stop one of my anxiety medications, which at the time was a low dose of Prozac. And I even questioned it because I said, I took this during my first pregnancy. But, um, you know, there had been three years, four years that had passed. So, Maybe there was more research that I didn't know about. So I stopped taking that and (laughs) there were some stressors, which I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. Um, We moved into a transitional rental house and then while we were trying to sell our first house and buy another house, um, there was a lot going on. And I, I know a lot of you can relate, have, have, have possibly had similar experiences because I know I've spoken to many people with the moves and everything, how stressful that was, especially during pregnancy. So then about 20 weeks in, I wound up in labor and delivery after calling, uh, the doctor and them sending me there because I was 20 weeks and I was having a lot of pain in my stomach, felt like, you know, hardening, possibly contractions. Uh, and I went in and basically it was a panic attack. Uh, and the OB at the hospital and the midwife at the hospital who saw me kind of like said, you know, is there a lot of stress going on? All these different things. And I talked to them and they talked to me about the risk and reward benefits of being on, you know, a class B, I believe, medication. So I was able to go back on what I had been taking before for my anxiety. Well, fast forward to having my second, who actually just turned two the week that this airs. Um, But I did not recognize my anxiety because with my first son, I was constantly worried about every little thing. Was he getting enough milk? Was he going to roll over in bed at night? Was he going to get out of his swaddle and have the blanket go up over his head? Was he going to, like, was he still breathing even though I wasn't staring directly at him? Um, All those different things. And so since I didn't have those similar worries... I thought I was in the clear after having my second. I even remember telling my general practitioner that, you know, when he asked what was different between, you know, first and second, how was I handling things? I was like, I don't have the anxiety I did before, which is uh, laughable kind of in a sad way looking back at it. But I just didn't realize that the anxiety could be manifesting itself in you know, feelings of failure, lack of feeling connected to the baby, uh, this anger and rage that was coming just if things weren't perfect and feeling like my husband, my sons would be better off without me. Um, just because then there would be one less person to take care of because I felt like I couldn't take care of them. They were taking care of me. I really felt like if I was spending time with the baby, I was being a terrible mom to my older son and vice versa. I felt like I was not giving the baby enough mental stimulation compared to what I had done with my first. And even knowing that it was not possible to be doing those same things because now I had to split my attention. Um, I also thought that both boys were going to resent each other or that being a parent to one child, being a good parent to one child meant that I was being a bad parent to the other. So I felt like I was really incapable of being a good mom to either of them. And that is its own issue in itself with it's like all or nothing attitude, which happens a lot with those with anxiety. I remember there was a point in time when I felt like I needed to call the doctor, but I wasn't sure, should I call my general practitioner? Um, Or I had heard at mom's group that there was a group of psychiatrists who specialized in new new mom's behavioral health and just women's behavioral health. Um, And 
I hadn't been able to get in touch with the facilitator of that because I wasn't able to go as regularly as I had with my first because of all the new scheduling demands of having an older child, like making sure he was at school, um, you know, and then also primarily because I dreaded taking Eli, my youngest, in the car anywhere. I felt like I was a hermit crab, you know, just staying home because I needed to make sure that it was the perfect time when, you know, all the stars properly aligned for the car ride because he screamed. Now, Ruben would have screaming times in the car, but he at least in the very, very beginning, if he was upset, I could like reach back, put a pacifier in his mouth at a stoplight or sing to him or put on certain music. And the, the, the car ride just, again, made me feel like a failure because with Ruben, when I was pregnant with Ruben, I was working about 25 minutes away. I was in my car a lot with work, driving from site to site. And I would play like a certain playlist that I made um, and sing along to it, kind of like preconditioning Ruben to these melodies and sounds. And I never did that with when I was pregnant with Eli. So I pretty much already felt like I had failed him before he was born because I didn't do these things. Um, So in the car, anytime he was screaming and the music, like his bedtime music or anything like that, didn't calm him like it did Ruben. I was just reminded again, well, good job. You shouldn't have done this. So (laughs) in addition to those feelings of failure, I was just constantly on edge because of lack of sleep and overstimulation. I feel like the lack of sleep was more so the second time around. And the overstimulation was something I had really never experienced before. Uh, And the only thing I could kind of compare it to would be like being distracted by somebody, you know, tapping their finger on the table in a meeting. And that sounds like it, that, that small little sound sounds amplified and then you're he- you're not really hearing what people are talking about. That's just kind of like noise in the background. So, or also my other comparison is, you know, when the orchestra is warming up before a concert and everybody's playing different notes, different sounds, up and down, left and right, um, but the conductor never stops and puts them at rest before starting the in unison playing. That overstimulation, having a baby screaming, a very inquisitive four-year-old, uh, the dog barking at the mailman, that's the smart speaker playing the news, the ice machine going, um, you know, loading or unloading the dishwasher, plus all the thoughts and worries and ruminations going on in my head, I felt like I was ready to snap. And that was definitely not something I liked um, feeling like I was going to snap. But I didn't realize until Eli was about nine, ten months old how little I had really been present and enjoyed our time together. I still can very vividly picture him crawling around on the floor when he was about 11 months old and me being like right face to face with him and just really feeling for the first time this sense of presentness, this calm, this enjoyment and lack of anxiety or, or overwhelm or and lack of being like pulled to one thing or the other. And I think of that moment as what kind of like felt like a weight had lifted and kind of sparked the idea for the Momsiety Club in its first iterations. So not long after that, uh, COVID hit. Uh, You know, I felt like I had maybe a month and a half, two months of really getting that better connection, bonding, and those things. And so then COVID happened and 
you know, I was anxious and worried about what I was hearing on the news, but staying home, being anxious, worrying about things that you couldn't see, (laughs) as in germs and everything, or viruses, I was like, what's, how is this going to be any different? This is not going to be different. Uh, well, I kind of had it down for a little bit, but then the, you know, anger when nothing was right in my mind of, you know, how things were done around the house, um, I needed to call the psychiatrist again. And at that point they had been working on getting me to a certain level of a medication, seeing how that was getting me to the next level, seeing how I was. And we had tried that and um, worked for a little bit, the top dose of Prozac. But then, you know, all of a sudden it just didn't. And the psychiatrist kind of explained it as sometimes something can work for you really well for a long time. And then you might have like that tipping point of one extra thing gets added. Um, I think that tipping point for me was, um, there was a ton of the, all of just the general anxiety in November. And we also, I had, (laughs) how I say in a joking kind of manner, um, kind of lost it and said that we could get a a dog, another dog. So (laughs) that, you know, I don't know why that just why I would do such a thing, but (laughs) it definitely added to the stresses and kind of felt like threw me right back down into that anger, rage, um, anxiety feelings. So we transitioned me down off of the Prozac and transitioned in Zoloft. And that's where I am now. And, you know, they say it took, takes like four to six weeks, which yes, to get the full effectiveness and know how the medication is going to work with your body. Um, but I remember there were, it was a couple weeks and like a week and a half, two weeks. And there again, I felt like this switch flipped in my brain where one day I was negative, feeling down. And then the next day I was like, oh, I can handle this. Yesterday, this would have set me off the edge. Today, yeah, okay, I'll be laid back about it. So with Eli now being two this week, um, the past few months have also been a bit easier since he is not as nearly as dependent on me. Um, And at the same time, it can also be harder because he seems to have hit those terrible twos a few months early. And um, we definitely have noticed the difference in having a child who is quote unquote healthy and a child who uh, was anemic, but we didn't know it at the time, uh, the energy levels of the ability to really throw that big temper tantrum and um, I guess persist with that temper tantrum. So that has been a new er new experience, even though we, he is our second. Um, All right, this podcast and the Momsiety Club membership have been so meaningful and a big part of my journey. The ability to feel safe and supported and have a space to be vulnerable really helps in more than one way. So your story may help someone else, and just as someone else's story can help you, me being able to speak with other moms and hearing what they're going through, similarly difficult times and having the same feelings, you know, has helped me as well as I've heard it has helped you and other moms who are listeners. And hearing that others are going through a similarly difficult time or having the same feelings lets us know that it's okay and that we can make it through. It really reinforces the fact that we're not alone, that being vulnerable, not having control of anything and, or sorry, not having control of everything and letting some things just be okay and not perfect is often the first step in overcoming those feelings of anxiety. 
I do also want to mention that, you know, nowadays more and more anxiety comes from the things we see on social media and the comparisons we make to them. Being vulnerable and sharing what is really happening at home instead of the picture-perfect photos can really help, number one, you be real, not have to worry about perfectionism, and also support others by showing that, you know, the social media pictures are not real all the time. Uh, you know, maybe there's a mom who is one of your friends who quietly sees your posts but doesn't usually comment because she thinks she's failing and doesn't understand how you do it all. And if she sees that, wow, you have groceries on your counter or there is laundry on, you know, the washer or the dryer that, wow, you know, it is okay she might feel like it is okay. I have those things too. And we're, we're all going through this. Oh, and I do want to just mention too, the overstimulation situation that I uh, mentioned a little earlier. Yeah, that still happens today, but I have learned and with medication as well, I'm able to you know, take a breath before reacting. It's not this immediate overreaction. And I can say, okay, could we please turn this off? Or could one person please talk at a time? And that definitely really helps because then I'm not immediately thrown into the negative spiral of, oh, you were too stern, you overreacted, or your tone was off and you came across as X, Y, and Z, and that means you're not being a good mom, you're not being a good wife, blah, blah, blah. Those those extra seconds to kind of, you know, calm and regroup and say something, or even then later notice possibly if I if my tone was off and address that, you know, that helps with the bond between you and your children, knowing that, yeah, not everyone's perfect. Sometimes things can go wrong, but we uh, we address it again later. Those have all been big improvements that personally I have seen. So to end this little mini series, or I think what now is being called a limited time series or a limited run <laughs> now on TV for shows, I want to summarize a few key p- points from the last three episodes and just from my story. Number one, everyone has anxiety at times. It can actually be a good thing, believe it or not. It's your autonomic nervous system kicking in, triggering your fight or flight instinct. But when the anxiety continues and your body doesn't know how to come out of that heightened state, this is where we run into the issues. So some things that you can do are, you know, ask yourself if when you are anxious, are you able to calm down? How long does it take you to calm down? What are the things that you do to calm down? What is triggering your anxiety? Is your anxiety affecting other parts of your life, like how you're interacting with your child or your ability to get things done at work or around the house? And If those are yeses, then that's a great um, starting point for you to be able to go seek professional help, either a counselor or a psychiatrist or just your general practitioner or your OB as a starting point. Number two, talk about your feelings of overwhelm with a trusted friend, family member, support network, or reach out to me and the Momsiety Club community. Again, there's that vulnerability that it is really challenging to do, but just being vulnerable and hearing others being vulnerable really can make a big difference over the long run. And just one little thing can have that big impact for you and for others. That vulnerability also kind of gets rid of the feelings of isolation because 
if you're not sharing these thoughts of, you know, not being good enough or that you feel like you're not doing enough, how are you going to know if someone else is feeling the same way? Um, Because guess what? They are. And it's just not something that is normally talked about. So again, that vulnerability and opening up with somebody that can definitely really help. All right. Are we on three or four? Apologies if my numbering is off. Three, (laughs) if you are parenting a child with a chronic illness, food allergy, or disability, you may feel like you have the whole world on your shoulders. And just as I said before, that you're alone, no one else is experiencing, experiencing these same things. But Use your voice again. This is the reach out again. Don't be ashamed of your feelings and worries. Um, They are valid. And again, no one else is going to be able to say, yes, that's me too, unless you speak up for yourself. We always talk about advocating for our children, but we really need to advocate for ourselves as well. Four, trust your intuition or trust your gut. And don't fear the doctor or the hospital. That was a big thing I learned going through the diagnosis with Ruben. You know, I was scared. I had no idea what going to the ER would be like. That I I was just too nervous about putting him through that, of having to be poked and, you know, get an IV or blood drawn. And really, in the end, it didn't make a difference. He had to have labs drawn. He had to have these other things happen. And maybe, who knows, that maybe we would have been able to figure things out a little bit sooner. But again, who knows? Keep advocating for your child if you think there's something going on and it's being dismissed. By all means, do not be a hypochondriac, but call, get a first, or sorry, call, get your opinion of a doctor, get a second or third opinion too if if you see something that's still there. Because as with lots of other things, um, you are seeing things 24-7 and doctors are seeing a brief snippet of time. And again, with that fear of going to the hospital that I had mentioned, even after all this stuff happened with Ruben's diagnosis, there were times when Again, I feared taking him to the hospital. What happened with his, um, when he was having a flare, when there was inflammation, he would just run a fever every single day and be completely fine. It was, you know, a fever from his body fighting the inflammation. And when he got sick, his fever would be high and high like 104, 105. Um, and we, we would call the doctor. We would call chop, make sure there was not, you know, something urgent that we had to take him back down there for. Um, But he was eating, drinking, you know, at least staying hydrated. So things were okay. There was a a time when we did have to take him into the ER. And this actually came and can go again back in with trusting your intuition. I took him to urgent care because I couldn't get him into his pediatricians until much later in the day. Well, urgent care, well, they took his temperature and they basically said, a a sick kid like this, if they have a super high fever, they're not going to be acting like this, yada, yada, yada. And I said, number one, the person who took his temperature did not take his temperature correctly. Number two, he has been given medication. So yes, his fever is going to be down. And so how about you listen to me? (laughs) They send us home. Well, then again, when his fever spiked and we gave him medication, it did not really do much of anything that time. So we decided to go to the ER and that I was worried. I was like, they're just going to do the same thing again. He's going to have to get an IV placed. It's going to be, you know, awful. And yeah, it was pretty crappy getting the IV placed there. Um, I thought the the nurses, it was nurse, two nurses and a doctor who had to kind of <laughs> help while I was hugging him. I, I thought the nurses were um, just kind of like overwhelmed and I don't know exactly how to explain what I kind of 
took from their faces. Uh, more like I kind of internalized and was like, oh, they can't handle this kid. Well, my husband had a different viewpoint and he said they were practically crying because of how upset Ruben was and they couldn't get the IV placed and it was, you know, it was heart-wrenching for them too. So <laughs> there's that. Don't fear it. They're there to help. And then the doctor who came in and saw Ruben later kind of reinforced that we did the right thing. Um, I think he knew that I was like, I don't know if we should have come, blah, blah, blah. He said, I had a child with lots of illnesses with a chronic illness. We were always in and out of the, the hospital. And you know, you, you're let you question, do they need to go in this time? Is this something they don't? He said, always bring them air on the side of caution, which felt really great that the doctor shared his experience and that it's not a bad thing. The anxiety and upsetness over getting an IV placed is not as bad as not getting an IV placed, you know, and getting the hydration and getting him better sooner rather than later. All right, next. I I have lost track of my numbering because I have them numbered, <laughs> but... <laughs> I also am like jumping around. So whatever number I'm on, we'll say we're on five. This seems pretty self-explanatory and pretty silly for me to say, but just because you may have had one experience with one child does not mean that it will be the same with the other. I still have to remind myself of this each day. Um, keep reminding yourself too, if that's a hard one for you. Number six, I guess. Self-care is not just going to the spa. We need to find our own ways to care for ourselves realistically. What I like to call realistic self-care. Listening to a book that you want to listen to, not, you know, Raffi or a kid's book on Audible or something like that. You know, there are times and places for that. Listen to a book you want to listen to. Move your body. Have a dance party. Take a walk be silly, laugh, take a drive with your kids in the back. Uh, who said it? Carrie, uh, who was on a previous episode said that, (laughs) you know, you can just take a little nice little drive vacation and drive around with the kids in the back. Um, or just going to the store by yourself. Well, some say, and I agree as well, that this is not true self-care, you have to do what you can get at, at, at the moment. And sometimes that is having someone else take the kids uh, and play downstairs or having the kids talk to someone on FaceTime while you get to clean by yourself. So it takes you, you know, 10 minutes instead of 30 because <laughs> once you put something away, it's being taken right back out. And my last takeaway, be grateful. Take a moment to thank someone. Relish in a moment. Be grateful of having the opportunity to sit and read a book with your child, to take a walk, to listen to music, to have your child be able to go to the doctor. Uh, All of these things. Be grateful. I. When Ruben was going through his diagnosis and when he uh, had to be admitted to the hospital, I am just so grateful that we had the children's hospital near us, that we are within about two hours of CHOP, that there are charities like the Children's Miracle Network uh, and Ronald McDonald House charities that do so much in the hospital more than what they really, what you see on um, advertisements and fundraising, not advertisements, on fundraising materials. Be grateful for the therapists that are there in the hospital helping your children, helping you. Be grateful for the time that we are living in, not necessarily the COVID time, but all the 
scientific breakthroughs that are here and medications that are available to treat kids and support kids with chronic illnesses and disabilities. Having an attitude of gratitude is a huge way to shift your mindset and help you start seeing more of the positive in the world. And in case you did not know, um, my personal experiences, our family's personal experiences with these specific charities, uh, like like Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Children's Miracle Network, those are why the first month of all new members fees are donated. Um, because look, I want to help every single mom out there, but I know that that's not possible. So in order to help even more that are than those that come and join the Mom's Anxiety Club, we donate to these services that really help families and children dealing with difficult times. And I'm just going to, again, reiterate that my true passion here is to help moms, new moms, and moms with children who have a chronic illness or other disability to establish a place to feel safe and openly talk about the challenges and joys of motherhood and mothering our children and how we can use movement and mindset for ourselves and for our children to help us all relieve anxiety and connect more. So now I'm just going to ask, do you have a story that you would like to share? Would you like to help others while also helping yourself by sharing your experiences? If so, connect with me on social media. I'm at Momsiety Club or email me hello at momsietyclub.com and let me know that you would like to share your momsiety story. And I just want to thank you. If this is your first time or your 10th or 20th time listening to the show, I personally want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy mom life to listen. Your time is incredibly valuable and I'm honored that you have set aside some time to join me. Whether it's while you're, you know, having some time on a walk by yourself or you're multitasking with your little one in tow. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and the Anxiety Club email list where you'll get weekly emails with updates and the latest resources. And please share the Anxiety Club podcast with a mom, friend, and leaving a rating and a review, specifically that review part, really helps on Apple and Spotify to help other moms find the podcast. So I would be so appreciative if you had a few minutes to do that. I love giving shout outs to those of you who do write reviews as a special thank you. For links to any of the information, just check out the show notes. And until next time, I will chat with you on social media or in the Anxiety Club. The Anxiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at one 800 273 talk The Anxiety Club membership is full of a group of amazingly supportive moms and pre and postnatal fitness tips and exercises to help you mentally and physically. The first month's fee for all new members this month is being donated to the Children's Miracle Network. When you're ready to join other mamas getting through the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood, head to join.momsietyclub.com to become a member and check out the Ultimate Momsiety Relief Package.